So hello and good morning, everyone. So welcome to our next installment of the OSTC seminar series. So it's my pleasure today to welcome Eric Caillou and Jill Pelfren from Norse, and they'll be talking a little bit about um, yield power law model calibration. So how do you use experimental data uh, to calibrate the model? So that'll be today's presentation. And then our sec next seminar series, which will be in a month from now, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, Mike uh, microservices, and it'll be Eric and Gilles back for that as one as well. So with that, I'll head it over to you too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. So yes, so we will talk about um, quetrometers and the calibration of um, Herschel Buckley rheological behaviors. So the agenda of um, my presentation will be starting with the Navier-Stokes equation and uh, going into uh, the um, different uh, training fleet uh, regical behaviors uh, uh, will uh, introduce a little bit uh, on the principles for rear meters, uh, quet rear meters, and then um, uh, we'll talk about um, the uh, calibration of the yield power law model for uh, on a rheogram. And then I will talk about um, uh, uh, shear rate corrections for non-Newtonian fluids and shear stress correction for non-Newtonian fluids. Then I will um, quickly present um, uh, the microservice, which is uh, implementing those corrections. Um, and uh, we have an example of web application, which is um, residing on top of this microservice. So uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions um, uh, during the presentation. So let's start with the, the basic and uh, with the um, um, Navier-Stokes equation uh, that you can see here. Um, which is uh, displayed here in this uh, tensor uh, form. And we are uh, here at the um, U, which is the uh, velocity vector. T is time, rho is mass density, P is the pressure. Tau is the uh, stress sensor. Uh, G is the gravitational field. And uh, um, F is the external body force of the fluid. So um, if we have, for example, a flow of um, a fluid into a pipe. Uh, so we have a, a differential pressure between the two. So we have a, a volumetric flow rate across that. And if we take a, at a certain position along the pipe, so let's say cylindrical and axisymmetric, so we will have a fluid velocity field, which um, will be such that actually the velocity at the wall will be equal to zero. And then it will be increasing and decreasing. Uh, around the axis of symmetry. And that's for laminar flow. And that uh, is called the Poiseuil flow. Um, now, if we take a slightly different configuration where we have actually a plate, which is moving at the top of another plate, and we have a liquid in between the two. So we will have also a fluid velocity field um, and uh, the um, due to the no slip at the wall hypothesis in laminar flow. So we will have zero velocity for the fluid uh, on the bottom plate, which is not moving. And it will be exactly the same velocity of the wall of the plate at the top. And then we will have uh, a gradient of velocity there. So, and that is called the quet flow. Um, so what is uh, important in uh, the Navier-Stokes equation is that uh, and actually, um, uh, we have uh, this um, uh, shear stress uh, stance sensor uh, here, which appear here. And one way to express it is uh, to use uh, the generalized um, Newtonian uh, approach and to say that actually this um, um, shear stress tensor is equal to a certain viscosity uh, times the shear rate um, tensor. And um, uh, this um, viscosity is often called the effective viscosity, is a function of um, the um, uh, shear rate and time in, in the general manner. Now, the shear rate is uh, defined as a second invariant of the strain rate tensor. Um, and that's what we would like actually to study because uh, if we want to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, so we need to understand this behavior between the, the um, shear stress tensor and the uh, shear strain tensor and the viscosity that we have in between. So 
Okay. Yeah. So let's go to how we study this. Um, hmm. Why is it not moving? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. No, it's moving. So um, let's go back to uh, the um, this um, viscosity uh, that we have uh, defined here. Um, first of all, so I said that it depends on the uh, shear rate and on time. And um, uh, the notion of dependence of the shear history is, um, and which means that it depends on time, is related to uh, either the tixotropy or the T, um, which is uh, whether the viscosity decreases with time, which is tixotropic, or increasing with time if it's aryopeptic. So um, what are the examples of um, the impact of uh, uh, the shear history on the viscosity? That's, for example, if we have a change of flow rate into a pipe. So if we have oscillations of the flow rate, so that will have a shear history, which influence actually the viscous, viscous, viscous behavior if we have a fluid which is um, having a dependence on the shear history. Um, even if we are not changing the flow rate, so if we pass through a restriction on enlargement, so for example, each time we pass through a tool joint um, or in the analysis um, uh, around the tool joint, then there will be also a change of uh, the shear history. And that means that actually the tixotropic effect will influence the results and the viscosity will take some time before it returns to, to some normal values. Um, and also if we have a rotational velocity, which is changing um, in, for the flow into the annulus, an annulus, or if we have a pipe lateral movement into the annulus. All this will influence the um, shear history and therefore the viscous behavior of the fluid. Now, most of the drain fluids are tixotropic, uh, and that means actually that um, uh, these effects of three string vibrations um, influence actually the um, radiological behavior of the fluid um, all along the string uh, and into the annulus. Um, no, usually uh, the um, uh, when we go to t in, uh, tending to infinity, uh, the um, viscosity tends to uh, uh, a value which is um, not influenced anymore by the shear history. So this kind of absentotic value which is um, happening there. So in um, what I will describe today, uh, so we consider that we are time t in infinity and therefore there is no more influences of um, tixotropy uh, on the fluid. And that's the basic assumption that we have when we do uh, uh, rheometer measurements uh, in with a rheometer, that we have rotated sufficiently long enough at one speed so that uh, we have uh, no influence of tixotropy. And in, uh, at another instance or another equation, we, we, we can discuss that problem because it is actually much more complicated than it looks. Now, um, considering that uh, we um, don't um, um, consider the shear history anymore, so we are in kind of steady state conditions for the viscosity. So um, the, the first behavior that we can have for this uh, viscosity is that actually it's doesn't depend on the shear rate. And in that case, this is a constant, uh, and that is called the Newtonian fluid. Um, now, the viscosity, even though it is constant um, uh, as a function of the shear rate, can still depend on pressure and temperature. And usually, uh, all the fluids uh, do depend. The viscosity depends on pressure and temperature. So that, that's something to bear in mind, actually, that all those viscosities that we're talking about are as a function of pressure and temperature. Now, um, if it's not a constant, it's um, it's a non-Newtonian fluid, and uh, if the um, viscosity decreases uh, monotonously with the shear rate, then it's a shear thinning uh, fluid, and if it's um, increasing, then it's a shear thickening uh, fluid. So um, most of the drain fluids are designed to be shear thinning, and um, very simple model for defining uh, sh um, both shear thinning and shear thickening 
uh, fluids is to use um, a power law definition, which is given by um, the K, which is a consistency index, and uh, gamma dot at the power n minus one. And um, if n is equal to one, then it's uh, Newtonian. Um, and uh, if n is uh, less than one, it's shear thinning. And if it's n is greater than one, it's shear thickening. Okay, so um, if we go back to the 1D uh, conditions, uh, so the relationship between the shear stress and the shear rate uh, will be without a tensor form. And um, um, we can have an additional effect that we can notice is that if we take the limit of the uh, shear stress uh, when gamma dot tends to zero, and if that value is finite and not equal to zero, then actually this value is called uh, yield stress. So that corresponds to the fact that actually we have in this curve of the shear stress as a function of the shear rate, um, an intersection to the axis um, there, which is not at zero. Now, the existence of the yield stress is um, an open question. Uh, it is adopted that actually it really exists. It's um, supposed that actually it's an ephemeral effect um, and that if you do experiments long enough, actually you will not see uh, the yield stress. Um, but um, you may have some kind of um, apparent yield stress, which is um, um, measurable if we are taking measurements uh, within a few 10 seconds or a few minutes. Um, and therefore, we still valid actually to talk about uh, uh, a yield stress uh, for uh, the type of behaviors that we are working with. So uh, the extension of the power law model with a yield stress is called the yield power law model and also called Herschel Buckley. And it looks like that. So we have Tau as a function of gamma dot, which is tau gamma, which is the uh, uh, yield stress plus uh, k times gamma dot to the power n. And this is actually the one of the model which is mostly used in our industry. So there is good uh, arguments to use over was over type, but uh, we will not uh, take the discussion today. Um, now the presence of this um, uh, yield stress means that actually you may have a plug region. Uh, when you have your Poisson uh, flow or your uh, quit flow. Um, and uh, because of that, actually, that um, uh, that means actually that uh, you have an unyielded uh, region um, in this flow. Okay. So let's go to the rare matters. Um, there are essentially four types of uh, rare matters. Um, there is a drag plate. Uh, which is really the, the principle of the quiet flow. So, um, and then you have the uh, cylindrical flow where you are rotating uh, some cylinders. And then you have the Poisson um, flow tube, which is more like flowing into a pipe. And then you have the plate flow where you have a, a plate which is rotating on top of another plate. Now, um, in this presentation, we will only focus on the uh, quite concentric cylindrical type of um, rheometer, which corresponds to the case B, cylindrical flow. And uh, there is actually um, two configurations which exist. There is the configuration which is called rotor bob. Uh, so you have a cup, you have a cylinder, which is here, which is rotating, it is a rotor. And then in the middle, you have a bob, and this bob is not rotating, but that's on the bob that you will measure the torque, which is caused by the rotation of the, um, of the rotor um, and influenced by the fluid, which is in between. And then you have a second configuration, which is called rotating bob, which is somewhat simplified um, in terms of the architecture, but actually more complicated to build um, technologically which is you have a fixed cup and then you have a bob into it and this bob is rotating and you measure the torque on the bob again. Now the um, rheometers can be mechanical or electronic um, with mechanical um, uh, rheometers. Uh, you, you have usually a fixed number of speeds and with um, more advanced rheometers, you can actually change uh, the speed as, as you would like and you can do more fancy things. 
Um, so the rotating bob solution is typically what is used in scientific rotors. The rotor bob configuration is typically what is used in the fan 35 or model 35 rotor, which is used in the old field. So we'll talk of both of them in this presentation. Now, uh, the fundamental equation for the um, concentric cylindrical quadrimeter is uh, defined by this relation that the um, angular velocity omega is equal to the integral between the uh, um, radial distance at the bob to the radial distance to the cup or the, the rotor in the case of the fan 35 of the gamma lot divided by r tr. Um, so this can be transformed into um, uh, as a function of the um, uh, shear ray, uh, shear stress, uh, sorry, and then that's uh, the integral of the shear uh, stress at the cup uh, to the shear stress at the bob um, of the gamma dot divided by two d two, and with a half in, in between. So you can look at the Krieger Elrod uh, article for derivation of that. Now, if you have a Newtonian fluid and where the um, shear rate um, is equal to a direct proportionality to the, so, sorry, the, the shear stress is a direct proportionality to the shear rate. So you can actually have um, an estimation of the shear rate at the bob um, directly from the rotational velocity or the angular velocity using this value C, which is the ratio of the um, radius of the cup divided by the radius of the bob. Uh, so if we take the dimensions of fan 35 R1 B1, so we obtain actually a conversion factor from uh, RPM to recipro reciprocal seconds of 1.702, uh, which is a well-known value which is used in the industry. Um, now, if we take a scientific chronometer uh, like an Anton Parr, um, actually, the convention is not to use uh, the um, shear rate at the bob to use the average value between the gap in the in the gap, and actually the formula which is used for the conversion for a Newtonian fluid is slightly different. It's uh, one plus c square divided by c square minus one times the omega. So need to know actually that um, this conversion from the shear uh, from the rotational velocity to the shear rate um, is somewhat different when it, we're talking of different type of rheometers. And uh, that is maybe not necessarily something which is known. But you need to keep, keep that in mind because if you have a scientific rheometer which gives you a shear rate, it is not necessarily the same than the one that you have actually for, uh, for fan 35 rheometer. Um, uh, now, um, the, um, to, to obtain the um, shear stress at the wall, so um, the idea is to measure the torque on the bob. Um, and uh, this is done by uh, taking the integral of the um, shear stress at the wall along the surface of the, of the bob. Um, and in, in practice, basically, we consider only the cylindrical part of the bob. And uh, we have actually the shear uh, stress um, at the surface of the bulb, which can be expressed like that by dividing by the surface of the cylinder. And you need to have this correction factor one plus phi to account for the fact that you have some end effects uh, on the flanks of the bulbs um, of the bulb. And um, if you look at the documentation for the fan 35 or even some measurements which has been made by uh, some authors like Calicidis. Um, so this value of phi is uh, around 0 0.064 for Newtonian fluid. And uh, um, Calicidis and co-authors has measured 0 0.067 in their procedure. Now, a non power rheometer um, do um, provide also a similar value, except that uh, the manufacturer provide a value of 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.064. Um, now, the value which is provided by uh, uh, 
the, on, on the power parameter, scientific parameter, uh, or at least most of the um, parameters, which is based on the ISO 3219 convention, um, is actually the shear stress in the middle of the gap, and which is actually needs to be converted compared to the shear stress at the wall. So, so need to also, again, to be very careful with the value that we get from the remitter. So if you have a remitter which provides you directly the shear stress and the shear rate, you need to know what kind of shear stress and shear rate you are talking about. Is it the ISO one? Is it the one which is the wall? But all this, what I've said, is only valid for Newtonian fluid. And that's what actually things are going bad um, because our fluids are not Newtonian. So um, before I go to the correction, so I would like to uh, talk about uh, the calibration of the yield power law model to a rheogram. So a flow curve uh, or rheogram is uh, end measurements of uh, the shear stress at the wall and the shear rate at the wall. And uh, what we'd like to do is to minimize uh, the difference or the sum of the square of the difference between the model, uh, which in this case is to gamma plus k gamma dot to the power n, um, with the measurements of uh, uh, the two that we've got. Um, so a method which is used in the industry is the one proposed by Kelly Sidis uh, in this uh, paper from, 2006, and uh, um, in this method, uh, actually, uh, what Kelly Cidis proposed is to say, okay, well, if we take the logarithm of this expression there, so basically, um, uh, we take logarithm of the tau, which is measured, minus the tau gamma, which is a yield stress, and then the rest actually can linearize because then that will be log of k plus n log of gamma dot. And then we can recognize a uh, uh, a straight line, and therefore um, solving the problem is uh, simple, because then we can just fit a uh, with a straight line, um, least square straight line fitting, these values there, as long as we have found a good guess for tau gamma. And basically the algorithm is to try to minimize, uh, on not on three parameters, but only on one parameter, tau gamma, such that actually this expression is as, me, as small as possible. Now, the idea is quite good and simple. Um, however, it has a, a flow, a mathematical flow. And, and the reason is that actually uh, this would be true if the error on the measurement of the shear stress was multiplicative. So if that was multiplicative, so that would be one plus epsilon times the value that will be the error that we have there. And then when we do this log of tau minus tau gamma, so we could extract the log of one plus epsilon, and that would be a kind of random error, which add on top of these two guys there. And therefore that will not influence too much actually the least square straight line that we try to fit. But in practice, actually this error that we have on the measurement for the tau, is not multiplicative, but it is additive. And if it's additive, it means that we cannot extract this value there. And these additive terms on the logarithm influence quite a lot for the values of tau i, which is very small. And that causes actually um, uh, somewhat large errors in the fitting of the um, herschel buckley um, calibration on uh, the measurements that we have. So um, Glenn Bulliner has come with a, a very interesting approach for solving this problem. And uh, it is actually based on the fact that, okay, so what we want to really minimize is uh, this uh, sum of the square of the differences. And if we want to find the minimum of this, so we want uh, to make sure that the partial diff diff derivatives are equal to zero as a function of tau gamma, k, and n. And if we solve that, actually, we, opt we obtain actually a, a system of uh, three um, equations. And uh, this system of three equations is, um, uh, can be written as uh, a determinant form, a matrix determinant, which is looking in this form, equal to zero. 
and you may notice that uh, in this um, determinant, the only thing which appears is actually N, which is this um, flow uh, consistency index, uh, the flow behavior index. And, and all the rest are the measurements that uh, we have uh, taken there. And that's really cool because then uh, if we solve this equation, uh, of course, it's not simple to solve, so it needs to be solved numerically. But actually from the measurements themselves, we can actually extract exactly what is N. And if we have extracted exactly what is N, then actually you can note that uh, this expression to I is equal to gamma plus K gamma dot I at power N. This is actually something which is known now. And we have actually a straight line. And then defining, finding what is to gamma and K is uh, just a matter of fitting a least square straight line on those values there because we have managed to extract N before. This is really, really smart and extremely efficient. So um, we can also try to solve the problem with more some brute force type of methods um, since it's a minimization problem. And one of those standard methods for mi minimization is uh, the Lovember marker uh, method. Um, the Lovember marker method is quite good, uh, except that actually our problem of minimizing those three parameters, uh, to gamma, k, and n, um, the problem is actually uh, having a lot of local minima, as this is represented here on this chart. And if you start from the, in the wrong place, for example, if you are starting in this region there, your Lovember marker would uh, end up in the completely different, uh, or not the maximum, the, the best optimum that you should have actually found here. And even around this place there, actually, you have plenty of small local minima. So to use the Lovember marker method, so you, you need to have a good guess of uh, the initial values before you start the algorithm. And, and one way to do that is actually to use uh, some research from Mario Zamora published in 2002, which says, OK, so to gamma can be actually approximated by the difference of the two at 3 RPM and two at 6 RPM for for fan 35. And then if you have a good acceptable approximation of togamma, so you can use the um, um, uh, method of Kelly-Sidis for approximating KNN. And if you use this initial value there to and apply the relevant per marker, so you converge quite well actually to the, to the solution. Okay, so um, is it really mattering uh, what I'm saying? So I'll take an example. Um, this is uh, some gamma dots uh, that I've listed here. This is some two values. Um, they are expressed in reciprocal seconds and in Pascal. The measurement precision is uh, 0.02 Pascal. That's because the precision of an Anton parameter. Uh, and this measurement precision is used for the calculation of the key square uh, because we will take the sum of those um, differences between the model and the measurements and divide uh, or the sum of the square and divide that by the um, uh, standard deviation for the precision which, so we, which is uh, this value and you see that if you use the Moulin method you obtain this value if you use the Lovember marker you obtain this value this is very very close and the key square are very close as well it's even a little bit better for the Moulin than for the Lovember marker but if you take the method from Kelly-Sidis, actually, so you obtain values which are quite different. All of them are different. Uh, both the, the tau gamma, the K, and N are different from the true minimum, which has been found very easily with the Moulin method. Uh, and the key square is much lower, showing that actually it's not a local. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's a local minimum. It's not. A, it's, it's not the absolute minimum. So, um, and you can say, okay, well, probably you have good fit nevertheless, but if you want to use uh, the Herschel Buckley parameter for studying, for example, the effect of um, uh, temperature or pressure or fluid composition, or things, that, uh, things which has been published in our, um, in our papers, um, you really need to have a stable method for calculating those parameters for the Herschel Buckley, and that you really need to find the true minimum um, for this minimization problem. 
And if you use the KLACDIS method, so actually you're not guaranteed to find the true minimum, and then you can get variations for the results, which are which will jeopardize your, your calibration that you want to do. So really uh, um, strongly advise to use the millionaire method um, to, to solve that because it's really, really um, um, both a smart and, and efficient method to, 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 to solve the problem. Now let's go to back to uh, one of the problems I tried to raise earlier, which is the, uh, the corrections of um, the values when the fluid is non-Newtonian from the equator meter. So um, let's look at um, what happens uh, for uh, the um, flow into the, the gap between the, the bob and the, and the, the cup or the rotor, um, depending on what kind of parameter we're talking about. Um, no, I, I, just for the purpose of the illustration, I will only use, I will talk about uh, a rotor bob configuration, which is equivalent to the fan 35, uh, but uh, everything is completely symmetric if we were talking about uh, the um, um, rotating bob configuration of a non-ton parameter. So basically what we can say is that um, we have a purely tangential uh, flow uh, um, in the gap between the cylinder of the bob and the cylinder of uh, the, um, the, the rotor. Uh, so we can uh, apply the um, Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, all the terms are equal to zero, except so, uh, and, and because of that, so we need to come to this uh, conclusion there that actually the shear stress at the wall needs to be uh, C divided by R square. Uh, and then C is a const integration constant. So um, then having this result, um, that's, very general reset for uh, this uh, concentric quetriometer. Uh, we apply the um, herschel buckley formulation and we can extract gamma dot from this formulation by reversing everything and we obtain this. And um, from there, so we would like to apply the um, uh, krieger elroyd um, formulation for uh, the quetriometer. Um, and uh, we need to find actually what um, is the, um, if you remember with the herschel buckley rheological behavior, so there is a risk that there is a plug region, uh, unshielded region, unshielded region. And um, we need to find what is the rotational speed, which is the limit by which actually we will not, not have a, a plug region. And at, exactly at that limit, um, so basically the, um, uh, the um, shear stress um, will, uh, at, the level, at the level of the rotor will be equal to uh, the, um, uh, to the uh, yield stress, uh, to gamma. Uh, so from there, we can estimate what is the integration constant. And then we can calculate using the krieger elroyd um, um, formula. Um, the expression of omega star, which is this um, um, limit uh, between the uh, rotational speed, the angular velocity, by which we will have or not uh, a yielded, uh, uh, an yielded region. And um, we obtain actually this equation, which uh, looks like that. And this equation uh, basically is um, only a function of xi and n. And this can be plotted there and you can see it's uh, plotted as function of C minus one. And then you have the value of that and you can see that uh, it is both a function of N and it's also a function of this gap. So if you change the gap, actually you, you will not have the same transition uh, for the rotational speed for whether you will uh, go for um, unyielded and unyielded region. Now knowing what is omega star, so we can actually uh, apply that to determine what is uh, the um, torque, uh, sorry, the um, shear, shear rate at, uh, at the bob. And um, if omega is greater than omega star, uh, then the um, Krieger-Elroyd equation can be uh, written like that. 
uh, where we have this integration constant C that needs to be determined. And um, uh, so uh, uh, when we solve that equation, because we know omega, uh, so we can uh, calculate what is the uh, shear stress at the bob, uh, because we know what is the uh, uh, this instantiation um, constant, and therefore we can calculate the shear rate at the bob. And this is our correction uh, that we can do, or this is a true shear rate that we have at the bob, not the one was, which was converted without regarding the the um, the um, uh, type of regical behavior that we have. So you see, it's it depends on many other things that is much more complicated than what we had for Newton fluids. Now, if omega is less than omega star, uh, then there is a plug division. And since we have a plug division, so we know what is actually the integration constant, because we know that at the radial distance of the plug, then the um, shear stress will be tau gamma. Um, and then we obtain with the um, uh, krieger elroyd equation, uh, a new equation, you know, which is you know, as a function of air plug, the radial distance of the plug. And this can be solved. And when we have solved that, actually, we can calculate again what is the uh, shear rate at the bob. Um, but that, uh, that is a slightly different uh, uh, solving that we had to do. Now, since all these calculations um, depends on knowing what is the herschel buckley uh, parameters, uh, tau gamma, uh, k, and n, that means that actually this is a kind of implicit definitions. And what we need to do is to um, inject initial guesses for tau gamma k and n, calculate the, shear, the new shear rate that we obtain with this method. And then we recalculate again tau gamma, tau, tau gamma k and n, and we continue like that until we have convergence. And when we have done that, then we obtain actually the um, the corrected values for the actual behavior of the fluid. And taking the same examples that we've got before, so we see that actually the gamma dot that we had based on the Newtonian hypothesis is transformed into these new values, which are listed here. Um, and if I take the um, uh, herschel buckley uh, uh, rheological behavior, you can see that actually after we have uh, corrected the shear rate, uh, we obtain a different values for the herschel buckley uh, uh, rheological behavior. Um, some variations, not so much. Uh, this is only the shear um, uh, rate, which is translated. Uh, but we will see that um, something else is also influencing that quite quite strongly, and that is the shear stress at the wall, which also needs to be corrected for non-Newtonian fluid effects. So um, going back to what I mentioned um, initially about the conversion of the torque, uh, which is uh, CB, um, into um, uh, shear stress at the wall, using this um, uh, hypothesis that uh, it is based on a cylinder. Um, these correction factors, one plus phi, means actually that we try to increase the length of the cylinder such that actually it is equivalent to um, the torque that we would have measured for a cylinder, which was uh, the same length. Now, this phi is uh, due to the end effects. So we have in this rotor bob configuration, uh, we have a conical part uh, here uh, where there will be some stress um, applied on this shape. And then of course, we will also the same thing on the flat side uh, on the bottom. Um, and then um, these effects uh, will of course influence um, the torque that we will be reading. Now the, the torque due to the um, rod, which is here, um, is extremely small because actually uh, um, the, the the torque is proportional to one over r square of the difference. So that it's that, uh, so the the larger is the distance between the the, the two there, so the less we have torque on this, and it's it's uh, proportional to the square of this difference. So, um, but we need to account for these effects there, and. 
also, if you think about that, you have this in the fan 35, so we have a rotor which is rotating there. Um, so you can think that uh, the fluid, uh, both in between the rotor and the cup, and in between the rotor and the bob, will have some movements here, both on top of uh, uh, of the bob and below the bob, and this can also influence the measurements. So, um, so here I'm, I'm basing the um, the estimation based on the paper from Lac and Paris. Um, published in, I don't remember, 2017, I think. Um, and basically uh, what they do is they introduce uh, the big M number and the Reynolds number for the meter, which is given like that. And what they did is actually to do uh, many CFD calculations of the um, fan 35 remeter with different configurations, uh, R1B1, R1B2, R1B, Three and B5. And um, they studied actually what the CFD calculations tells about um, these end cap effects. And the results are really interesting because um, um, uh, you can see actually that uh, there are very strong effects. And you, you can see, for example, this in this R1B1 configuration. For a Bingham number equal to zero, which means that the, the yield stress is equal to zero, uh, you have actually those flow, which inf is influencing the bottom of the, um, the bulb there, and you have this flow here, which is influencing the conical part. But if, if the Bingham number is uh, relatively large, which means that you have a large yield stress, actually you have quite different uh, contribution to the torque on, the, on those conical and flat sides there. And then for the R1B2 configuration, where you have the gap is larger. So again, you have different type of results that you've got there. So all the calculations are true between Reynolds number between 0, 0 0.1 and 250. And basically, um, so we can see that uh, when uh, N is equal to 1, which is uh, Newtonian, and B tends to 0. So we are back to the um, uh, Newtonian case. Uh, that means that there is no yield stress. Uh, basically, the values that they obtain is around 0 0.1, which is not so far away from this 0 0.064, which is provided by the manufacturer. Um, but if um, the um, uh, Bingham number is increasing, what happens is that all, independently of n, in a way, all the values converge to some asymptotic t value and this value is uh, equal to 0 0.27. That's for the configuration so R1B1, uh, the classical one which is used uh, for the fan 35 area meter. And you can see that as a function of n, um, so these curves that you have here will be quite different, okay? But if you have an n which is very small, actually, so this correction factor is much way larger than this 10% uh, that we were talking about. It's more like uh, approaching 23%. Uh, so, so this is strong impact actually. Um, the um, the n uh, value into the um, Herschel Buckley um, uh, definition, and also the the tau gamma uh, has also a strong impact, as you can see through the Bingham number. Um, you have uh, uh, also some inertial effect uh, that can be also um, uh, influencing the results. So if you have large Reynolds number when you are rotating fast, you can see also that uh, the values are increasing quite a lot actually for this uh, phi value. So you need to be careful also that uh, actually the, um, at high rotational speed uh, in the rheometer you may have some additional influences which are um, uh, impacting actually your results. So us, uh, in our experiments, we tend actually to limit. So we use uh, not a fan 35, but we use an Anton Pariometer, scientific rheometer, and we, we tend to limit our uh, rotational speed to uh, no more than 100 RPM. Um, we never go much larger than that because the interesting part anyway is the low range actually of the rotational speed. So, and, and 
The problem with that is that actually with the fan 35, you have very few measurements at low rotational speed and at higher rotational speed, you may have these influences there, which are actually quite bad. Now, um, uh, they publish actually uh, uh, a formula for calculating this uh, value of phi for, um, uh, for, uh, for this, and that they provide some numerical values for the different parameters for the R1B1, R1B5, and R1B2 configurations for the, um, for the rotor bob configuration for the uh, fan 35. Um, no, does that matter? Again, that's important to know whether it matters. Here is an example, um, the same example as before. This is the uh, Newtonian values uh, for the shear, shear rate. This is the Newtonian shear stress as converted by using the um, 0 0.074 uh, pi value. And this is the value that we obtain after corrections using the uh, information from Lac and Paris. And you can see that actually we obtain quite a lot of different uh, uh, corrections. Huh? So um, the node, all this, the this shear stress, which is translating at every position for the shear rate. And that gives a, a very, very different type of um, um, results. Now, of course, you need to combine the two of them. And that's what you can do here. So you both apply the correction for the shear rate and the correction for the shear stress. And the value that you obtain is here and you see it's really, really different. And, and that's um, make, uh, um, that, that shows how important actually these corrections are. And now you can say, well, um, is this true? Is this um, only just theory or is this really what happens in real life? And I will show you that um, that it is actually a real problem. Um, this is a fan 35 parameter, which is equipped uh, first with uh, the, the purple dots here um, measured with uh, R1B1 configuration. The same fluid is afterward measured with R1B2 configuration, that's green points. And you can see that the two flow curves doesn't match at all. And that's the same fluid. Yeah. The only thing you've changed is the size of the gap. And that's really annoying to think that actually you measure the same fluid with the same rheometer, you change the gap and actually you obtain two different flow curves. But if you apply the correction that I've been mentioning from both values there, you obtain this and you see actually that they all match quite well, both, both values there. And actually there are even more different than the two that was measured before. So really quite important um, uh, and visible actually effect that um, these um, flow curve measurements are completely wrong if you just apply the Newtonian hypothesis. Now you can also say it doesn't matter for flow in pipes or flow in annular. And I can show you some results that we have with um, 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 a fluid that we have uh, flowed into um, a flow loop uh, in our lab. This is the um, regical behavior that has been measured with the Anton Parr rheometer, scientific rheometer, extreme good precision, 0 0.02 Pascal in terms of torque or, or for, for the um, uh, shear stress at the wall. And if this is the differential pressure that we measure at three positions along the flow loop, and you see that the calculated value from this regical behavior doesn't match the DP that we measured. And this is very annoying because we are supposed to measure this extremely precisely with a scientific parameter, and that even doesn't match actually what we measure with a pipe parameter or with a pipe differential pressure measurements. But if we do the correction of the values, using the uh, uh, method that I just uh, explained to you, you see that actually the values that we calculate actually match very well with the measurements from the differential pressure measurements. That again confirmed that actually those corrections are extremely important. And if you are surprised that uh, sometimes your hydraulic calculations doesn't fit with uh, your pressure drops that you have uh, measured with the PWD or at the pump pressure, 
well, that may be wrong in your calculations, but that also can be that you have used actually the biological behavior from your operations directly without doing those corrections, and that will actually strongly influence your results. Okay, so all this is implemented in, in C sharp. I see the time is flying, so I need to wrap up very quite quickly. We've packaged that into a microservice uh, so that um, you can access actually the calculations from any programming language. So if you are developing in Java or in Python or in C, you can actually access this microservice directly using uh, JSON um, as uh, payload objects actually for the REST API that we have created for you. And uh, there are a certain number of um, classes into this, so I will just jump quickly abo above all this. Um, you can read and you can uh, uh, have more details if, if you wish or if you contact me or Gilles uh, for those aspects there. And um, yes, I can show you actually how does it look like in terms of uh, the application. So we made a a small, um, uh, a small uh, web application on top of this um, microservice. So if you go to this uh, website, which is called app.digiwells.no, uh, you will have a list of different microservices that we make um, available to the community. And, uh, and one of them is YPL calibration. So you can click on the link here, and then you obtain this um, web um, application which is on top of this microservice and from there you can um, investigate uh, those different um, uh, values there so um, i can uh, change for example to uh, prefer metric uh, sorry for you guys who are used to english systems uh, but um, there we have the definitions of uh, some some values uh, from um, uh, a rheometer that's a fine rheometer we could have used um, uh, some uh, other type of measurements like uh, this uh, one. Small bug that uh, need to be fixed there, which is uh, based on more on a Anton power type of uh, rheometer. We have a list of different rheometers that we put into the microservice, uh, like uh, two types of Anton power meter, the 301 and the 302 different configurations for the model 35 parameters with R1B1, R1B2, R1B3, R1B5. Uh, we have six speeds and eight speeds. Um, so you can connect your programs to different type of parameters. And then if you want to look at uh, the, um, the differences between the Mulineux and uh, Kelly CDs and Levenberg marker calculations. So you can use this um, YPL calibrations method there. Um, and you can uh, see, for example, the values that you obtain here um, based on those measurements that you have here. Uh, so you can see that uh, both the Mulineux and the Levenberg marker agrees quite well for the calibration while the KDCD is, um, is slightly off. And then if you want to look at the uh, effect of uh, calibration, um, or oh, correction, sorry, you can uh, utilize this uh, page here, which is YPI corrections. And there you can uh, look at uh, all the different um, uh, values compared to the original curve that you have with the Newtonian hypothesis and the fully corrected curve, which is uh, visible here. And then the other curves, which are the intermediate one with only the correction of the shear rate and uh, only the correction of the shear stress. Yes. Uh, and then just two minutes before the end of uh, the um, meeting. So if you have any questions, uh, I will try to answer. And I can quickly go back to my conclusion slides, um, which is um, simply that um, the Mulliner method is um, uh, extremely efficient for fitting the Archer Buckley to uh, the fan to, to the uh, flow curve. Um, all those shear rate conversions and shear stress conversions, which are provided by manufacturers are only true for Newtonian fluid. And this is not true uh, for non-Newtonian fluid and needs to be aware of that. 
And we have implemented those corrections and uh, they are available in C Sharp or through a microservice. Yes. Any questions? Thank you so much for that, Eric. Um, so if, I, if you have any questions, please go ahead and speak up. Um, I have one quick question. So frequently for the mud pulse, like for the service companies who provide downhole telemetry, they occasionally have issues um, because the fluid rheology information they put into their model is incorrect. Do you think mm. part of this is the, because of the miscalibration between the fluid measurement and what their model is assuming? Uh, I cannot answer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> I, I, maybe, maybe, uh, but I, I will not be completely certain that it is the only reason. Um, there are other sources of discrepancies like the effect of temperature and pressure mm -hmm. on the rheology. And so sure. if you put only one single rheology, uh, the one at atmospheric pressure and 50 degrees Celsius, probably it doesn't fit anywhere along the well <laughs> or maybe yeah, one single true. place. So you have so many things that can actually influence your calculations. Uh, so what I've presented there is one source, and this is actually a strong one. Um, but there are so many other sources that actually I think uh, there are very many, many good reasons why actually it doesn't work or it, it may fail. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I, I, by the way, thank you, Eric. That's, uh, that was a level of detail that I haven't seen or ever dug into since uh, college days, I would say <laughs> for sure. So um, actually beyond what I dug into, let's put it that way. A question that I had was, uh, and, and I was going to ask you about how does this really apply in real world? And you've answered that question. Uh, so my next question was going to be, what about the effects of a cuttings bed uh, hmm. you know, oh, yeah. that, that we, we don't have the flow area. We think we do, we've got mixture yeah. of fluids. And so is, is that a primary effect as well as this one yeah. or? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, okay. So uh, there are many interesting questions, <laughs> many different <laughs> aspects uh, behind this question. So the first thing is actually, um, when you have cuttings under transport, the, the cuttings particles or the solid particles influence your logical behavior your apparent mm -hmm. behavior. Yep. So, so I've, I published a paper of four or five years ago, I think about that. Uh, so we made extensive analysis of, depending on the size of particles and the type of fluids and things like that, how this influence. And it is really strong influence actually, just the fact that you have cuttings being transported. So uh, that's also another aspect of the source of uncertainties for your calculations. And then, of course, um, when you have a cutting spread, the cutting spread is not really something which is uh, completely fixed and static. Huh? So it, it's a mo moving beast. <laughs> and, yep. um, and you have uh, some, some layers which are more, more or less f f uh, flowing, and, and then uh, you have things which are more consolidated in some ways. So, and all this, of course, influence your, your pressure loss calculations. Um, no, the other thing, uh, uh, I focus here only on air shape clay, um, but there is actually a better rheological behavior than air shape clay, which fits um, our fluids much better than air shape clay, and this is called the Kimada uh, rheological behavior. So hopefully we will be able to publish similar things for the Kimada rheological behavior. And, and that's also improved the calculations of, um, so also this is another source of, um, possible improvement is to use a better rheological behavior. So, but there are many different sources of um, uncertainties for the pressure loss calculations. And, uh, and as I mentioned also, the, that's what we do actually work very intensely in a research point of view is uh, the effect of tixotropy and the pipe movement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, which is also influencing quite a lot. And we have, um, we've, High, uh, high frequency measurements down the hall of um, pressures, we see effects which can only be explained by the tixotropic effect and the mm. stick slip. Stick slip. Uh, so when you have stick slip and the transition, you have enormous accelerations. Uh, so you go from zero RPM to maybe 600 RPM in half a second. And, and you can think about 
this is really influencing your fluid during these things. And you can see actually on the measurements with high accuracy, uh, PWD with high frequency, those effects are very visible, very, very visible during stick sleep. So yeah. plenty of things. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, actually, the, uh, that is a good one, too, on the stick slip that uh, I've seen even in surface data, the surface pressure yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, effects with stick slip on a long yeah. well. So, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. So that was a good question, and I don't think I have the full answer for the questions. <laughs> no, that's good, though. I, well, I think this is outstandingly good work and, and uh, appreciate your efforts and, and that you've uh, published it and made it open and available. Thank you for that. Hope it can be useful to everybody. So I, I do, I, let me ask you if uh, yeah. uh, one other question is, um, because the correction to the uh, just the rheometer uh, really should be applied, I would think by the rheometer manufacturers almost it should be here's our here's our revised uh, calculation method. Have you approached them and and said, hey, here, uh, no, no, we think um, you should. Yeah, but but then it so the, the the method that I proposed actually is based on the fact that we use this Herschel Buckley. If you use a Kimada then that would be a different correction. If you use a Caro, that would be a mm. different correction. If you use uh, uh, Heinz Casson, that would be a different one. <laughs> so each of those chirurgical behavior needs to have their own correction methods. And that makes life very difficult for the manufacturer. So that's why actually choosing the right chirurgical behavior is so important. Because if you want to make the right corrections, you need to have the right chirurgical behavior, which fits with the results. Yep. Um, yeah, so going back to why use Herschel Buckley or why use Kimada, and yes, uh, definitely not use power load, definitely not use big and plastic. They never fit anything. Yep. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Uh, All good right. morning, Eric. Uh, thank you for a good presentation. How are you doing? Hey. Um, uh, basically, uh, just wanted to ask you then, you are in, in a sense saying that all these new automated measurements are better or equal to uh, the traditional measurements. Is that correct? Ah, yeah. So uh, I would say that, uh, that uh, actually, um, so if you use a pipe uh, inline pipe rheometer, so actually you don't have those errors coming from the quet concentric geometry. So actually you can obtain values which are actually much better than the one that you have with the with a, even a scientific rheometer like an Anton Power, which costs a lot of money. Um, so yes, this is true, but this is true in the surface. And if you go in, dive into the details, and so you will find actually this is not so simple because of the tixotropy and um, because our fluids are tixotropic um, and they need to be tixotropic uh, for many good reasons. So if you flow these fluids into a pipe rheometer and you have change of diameters and usually you have change of diameter because they use at least two different type of diameters to measure two shear rate at the same time. So and uh, uh, so you will have tixotropic effects, which influence the results. And again, so the results you got are not so good as you would have expected. Um, so so we're working with uh, one of those uh, manufacturers to try to compensate for that. Um, but we also notice with uh, with the people working with pipe parameters that they are struggling to convince people in the field that the aerology is is good because it doesn't fit the fan 35 values. And actually it cannot fit fan 35 because the fan 35 are wrong. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> in consideration, the fan 35 is dependent on a lot of factors. Yeah. First of all is human. <laughs> so yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was evaluating some uh, tools and basically uh, the same question came up, uh, how you can be sure this is accurate. Uh, you know, taking in consideration that these measurements, the hand measurements are done by an experienced guy. Mm. 
Uh, so that's uh, kind of a question we always see, but we can yeah. say, uh, well, this is what we can do. Uh, this is the best, I guess. Yeah, and, and what I've suggested to one of those manufacturers of pipe parameters is actually, if you want to to stop the discussion, so just use this method that I've explained and yeah. reverse engineer, actually, what would have been the measurement from the fine 35 parameter? Right. And because you can just re inverse the method and, and you would have measured actually some values with the fine 35 parameter and then the values that they calculate based on the fitting of the differential pressures along the pipe uh, can still be the good one, but then they can generate fictive pseudo fan 45, it, supposing that you have a good uh, operator of the fan 45. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah. of course. So let me ask you another question uh, while we're in this topic. Uh, so do you have a suggestion of uh, like a certain length of pipe that we should ah. be using or <laughs> diameter? Oh yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I think you would need so with some of those fluids that we have tested, um, for example, some uh, polymeric fluid which are very thixotropic, you will need several hundred meters to to remove the problem of thixotropy. So the the solution that we are working out now at the moment is to say, okay, well, if you can't remove it, just utilize it. <laughs> so put two at least two DP sensors along the pipe and measure the difference of DP that you have along the pipe, because then you have an, an additional information, which is extremely useful, which is actually how the sheer history influence your DP measurements. Hmm. Um, but then that needs more math and more physics actually to, to derive uh, the stuff. So it's less simple than simple, uh, the, the, the simplest calculation, which is made usually for the pipe parameters. But if you include that, actually you have both the right values and in general, you have additional information about thixotropic behavior, which is extremely useful. And that's where actually Kemada, the Kemada rheological behavior, which is built from the ground up from physics, is extremely useful because actually it starts from the hypothesis that the fluid is thixotropic. And, and therefore, you can actually adapt the Kimada model for the thixotropic behavior and the pipe parameters and things like that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So we, we, me and Jill, we are still working on uh, this um, microservice and web app. So um, hopefully, uh, do. Uh, during the week, uh, there, will, there will be some improvements that we, we have and uh, it will be more stable uh, within one week. Um, but you can experiment a little bit uh, with, uh, with the server that we put online uh, for you. So yeah, if you wish so. And if, and if there is any problem, so just contact us and we'll try to fix that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I think with that, uh, thank you so much, Eric. That was wonderful and great discussion afterwards as well. Um, the recording is now going to be ended.